different episode of Tiny Nest. I'm Kiva. And I'm Jake. This series is following our tiny house project from the early stages through to completion and beyond. This is part one of our electrical rough-in. In the next few videos you might be looking around and think, what the f*** is all that? And this! My god! We'll be going over our regular electrical first and then getting into some detail about this stuff because that's the order that we did the work in. We're roughing in our electrical and it's always best to complete one step before moving on to the next. So the first thing we've done is planned all the locations that the wiring will need to get to. This means boxes for plug-ins or switches or lights or whatever, but we also needed to account for everything else, such as our water heater and our furnace, which need an electrical hookup. We also have an LED lighting system with motion sensors and a few other things that we'll get into later. We also did our best to plan ahead for any scenario where we might want to plug something in. So for example, here is where our corner couch is going to go, and we put a plug in the corner there just on the off chance we wanted to plug in a laptop or a fan or anything, and that'll save us having to run a cord across the room. The other type of box that we have are these little plastic things that are referred to as vapor boots. This type of box is suitable for full like 120 volt or 240 volt power cabling because it's um, sturdy and will protect it and is approved for, for that. Uh, but for little stuff like control cabling or low voltage stuff, we don't need that kind of uh, protection. And these boots have more volume inside, so it's more space to work with with all the fiddly little wires. The way the plastic is cut is such that it's easy to attach it um, like with the, the vapor tape to the vapor barrier uh, and incorporate it into the whole the plastic sheeting that we're going to have here. Our lighting system is going to be centrally controlled and the switches for it are going to be little push buttons and the wiring that's going to connect to the buttons is uh, CAT6 cabling which is the same type of cable that you'd use to connect a computer to the internet. So that's the type of wiring that we're going to be bringing into these little vapor boots. Now that we know where all the wiring needs to go, we're preparing the paths that the wire is going to take to get to everything. So I'm drilling out all the paths. And normally I would drill a fair size hole because things inevitably get added and uh, you want a little extra space to work with. But because we have such a tight grip on the plan for this, I'm just drilling holes um, as big and as is needed for the wiring that's going to take that path. And that way we maintain just a little bit extra structural strength because we're taking out a little bit less wood. Another thing we're keeping in mind when drilling is that there's eventually going to be interior siding uh, nailed or screwed on here and then we could be like hanging pictures or uh, fastening something to the finished wall down the road. And we wouldn't want any of those fasteners to come in and poke and damage the wire. So one way of protecting against that is using these protection plates, which you just drive in to the stud in front of the wire. But we wouldn't want to put these in front of every stud, in front of every wire in the whole house, because that would get ridiculous. And it's not required as long as the wire is an adequate depth into the framing. And in the Canadian code, which is all in metric, it requires, uh, or rather a protection plate is not required if the wire is a minimum depth of 32 millimeters, which is around an inch and a quarter. And in two x four framing, a hole drilled dead center will always guarantee that the wire is more than that minimum. So we're gonna aim for that, and then anywhere where the drill, maybe we can't quite get in it, uh, the right angle and we end up with a hole closer, we'll put in a protection plate to protect that particularly vulnerable spot. Alright, I'm using a little trade trick with the reels here because I don't have a rack on site and I got too many reels for a rack anyway. Uh, so you can see I just stapled in some scraps of wire to hold up all the different reels so I can just pull whatever at, at will. And so what we've got here is 14 gauge uh, two conductor, which is sort of general purpose for regular plugs and stuff. Then there's 14 gauge three conductor, which we're using mostly to pull two of the general purpose circuits at once, which we can do because we have both legs of the system with the 240 volt uh, panel. And then this is 12 gauge two conductor, which uh, is good for 20 amp circuits as opposed to the 
15 amps that the, the 14 gauge is good for. And that's gonna be used for uh, the, the plugs in the kitchen. And we're also gonna make use of some of this in the 12 volt system, which we have uh, in place to power the uh, furnace, the water heater, and the LED lights. And speaking of the LED lights, this is 16 gauge four conductor, which is gonna be used to power the actual light strips. And we need the four conductors to do the, the multiple colors. It's one conductor per color channel. So we'll get into that later. But uh, then there's also the CAT6 cabling for the control. And that comes in the boxes like this. Uh, so they'll just sit on the floor when you pull that. Today I'm the electrical apprentice and I learned that I need to make sure there's enough wire at the panel and to label all the wires. Oh, should it be this hard? You gotta, you gotta make sure it's oh, in the jaws. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> we dropped loops in this run for the plugs and now we're clipping them. We're leaving lots to work with because in electrical, it's better to be looking at it than looking for it. So you remember that when we insulated the roof, we put these boxes in uh, during that process and left wires hanging down with some length. And now that we've got a place for them to go, I'm just gonna reroute them here and get them to the right length to go into this box. To secure the wires down, I've always used these metal staples, it's just what everyone uses around here. And there's these big ones that are good for two wires if you lay them flat on top of each other, as well as for the three wire type of cabling. And then there's these smaller ones that are good for if you just have a single um, two wire type cable. But over here where we're fastening into the stained joist, I didn't want to use these metal ones because they tend to chew up the wood quite a bit. And even though this will be covered in the end, I uh, went with these plastic ones for a bit of a cleaner installation. I've seen these a lot and always thought they were kind of hokey, but after using them here, I sort of understand their purpose now. The metal ones can be a lot faster because you just bash the whole thing in in one go, but the little nails on these guys are much easier to sink in individually. So in a spot like this where you don't have a lot of room to swing, you can still um, seat these down all the way and get it nicely secured without much difficulty. But the metal ones are always a struggle if you have a bad angle or not a lot of room to swing at it. The code specifies a minimum number of supports for cabling and we're putting staples in every few feet and whenever it makes a turn and so on. So we'll have well more than that minimum. And another requirement is that there be a support within a foot of a box. And I like to put a staple in really close to the box and then do a little bit of an S in the cable so that it'll enter something like there. And that way, if the cable in the box were to become damaged for some reason after the walls are finished, there's a tiny bit of cable that we could actually pull through into the box and get a few more inches in a worst case scenario situation. There's a couple spots along the front flange where we're passing wiring through, and this is one of them. The other two are going to be for LED lights, and this is the only actual power wiring that's going through. Uh, it's going to be for an outside plug, um, We've talked about being able to plug in our induction cooktop outside on the table uh, while we have maybe a barbecue out there and do some sort of outdoor cooking during the summer months. And also just having a utility plug outside is uh, can be useful. So that's the purpose of this. It's 12 gauge wiring and it's gonna be a 20 amp plug. Um, and just as we've done elsewhere where we've gone through the flange, we've lined the hole with some of that uh, plumbing insulation to kind of cushion it and keep it tight and then uh, put some protection plates in front because we don't know exactly what kind of you know baseboard and whatnot is going to be affixed down there so making sure it's protected and then I've also left a service loop uh, the same way I do when I enter boxes just so that if uh, anything were to happen to the wires inside the box there's the option to pull a couple extra inches uh, through to work with. So here's what it looks like with the wire just poking through. And I know that when the connector goes on, 
I'm gonna want the wire stripped. I need a boat there. I'm gonna do that now before we get too far. I should point out that I'm using this red jacketed cable with a red and black wire, only because I had a whole bunch extra kicking around. Normally, a red and black wire indicates that it's a 240 volt run with one leg of the system on each wire. But this is just gonna be a regular 120 volt plug with this wire used as a neutral. So I'm gonna identify it as a neutral by wrapping it with white tape. This is actually a requirement of the code and the theory behind it is that if someone were to come into a box in the future that has a black and a red wire, where the red wire was actually being used as a neutral, and they were looking for a 240 volt connection, and they connected something 240 volts, you could get all sorts of problems, including a dangerous short circuit or overheating or something like that. So the standard is that any color, except for green, which is reserved for grounding and bonding, can be used to indicate a hot or live wire but because the neutral is special, it always needs to be identified as white. So now I'm gonna slip the connector on and get it cinched down onto the outer jacket up here. And make sure that I've got it pulled through enough. So I've got my box all ready to go with the weather stripping, the hole already uh, drilled and lined up. So I'm gonna slip it over like so. And then this is probably gonna be a bit of a pain, as it always is, but I need to get the lock ring slid over here and cinched down onto the uh, the threads of the connector here. Oh man, never fails to be a pain to get a lock ring in where you can't reach easily. All right, so the box is just being held on by the lock ring, which is on there uh, just finger tight. And I've already got my holes pre-drilled through the flange, so now I can cinch the box down and then I'll finish off the lock ring. So now I can tighten down the lock ring by just using a flat blade screwdriver to uh, grab one of the little teeth on the outside of it and just bash it around until it feels fairly snug. And these are just crappy cast uh, metal, so they can be broken fairly easily. So it's always good to just give it light taps until it feels uh, nice and snug. So that's pretty much done. Uh, I'm gonna tuck these wires in for later. And then um, I'm gonna put the cover on. I don't have the plug yet. We'll do that as the last step, obviously, to put all the devices in but I do have the cover, so I'm just gonna cover this to make sure it's uh, sealed from the weather, and then we'll put the plug on later. If you wanna see some of our previous videos, click on the preview tiles, and subscribe if you wanna follow our progress. You can also visit our website here. The way are you filming? Yeah. Okay. Are you still filming? <laughs>